Chicomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Christian Luscher. Dr. Luscher is a neuroscientist at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. His lab is interested in the cellular mechanisms that underlie drug reinforcement, dependence, and addiction. They spend a lot of time studying rodent models of addiction, looking at the mesolimbic dopamine reward system in the brain. These are a series of circuits that are really important for reward-related behavior and addiction-like behavior in animals. A key component of that circuitry in the brain is the neurotransmitter dopamine. And so we spent some time talking about addiction and different addictive drugs and how they work and how they change that circuit in order to take an animal from casual consumption to compulsive consumption. And we spent much of this podcast talking about a really recent research paper that Christian's Lab put out, and it had to do with ketamine. So they looked at the mechanisms of action of ketamine, how it's actually working in the brain in this mesolimbic dopamine reward system, and whether or not it's addictive or how addictive it actually is. And what they actually found is that ketamine has quite a low addictive addiction liability compared to other drugs like cocaine or opioids. And it has this low addiction liability because it acts in a sort of peculiar way within this circuitry. It causes certain changes and it does not cause certain other changes. This has to do with its mechanism of action, how it's working at receptors in the brain and things like that. So Christian gave us a nice summary of that research, what it tells us about how ketamine works in the brain and its addiction liability, and what this might mean for human applications of ketamine. It's been used recently as a rapid acting antidepressant. And so he gave us his thoughts on the future of ketamine as a therapeutic in humans for depression, um, whether or not there's going to be uh, much risk for addictive behavior there in humans, and what some of the promises are for ketamine as antidepressant, as well as what some of its shortcomings could be. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing on this podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out my substack, mindandmatter.substack.com. You'll find written content there that has to do with subjects. I cover across multiple episodes of the podcast. There is a free weekly newsletter you can sign up for to learn about what's going to be happening on the show and who's going to be on. And you can check out the video version on YouTube. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Christian Luscher. I am good. Uh, can you remind everyone who you are and where you're located? Yes. So my name is Christian Luscher. I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And over the last 20 years, I've led a lab interested in the mechanism underlying the neurobiological mechanism underlying drug addiction. And you've got some recent work that's out about ketamine, and we're going to get to that. But I thought maybe a a good starting point would be some basic biology for those that don't know it. So when you talk about a drug that is addictive, what specifically does that mean? And what parts of the brain and circuits in the brain do we tend to focus on for addictive drugs? 
Yes, indeed. So we work in mice, and that allows us to make observations that are typically not possible in humans. So over the last 20 years, we have looked at many different elements of what addictive drugs do in the brain. To start, we realized that uh, addictive drugs converge onto a one specific system that called the mesolimbic dopamine system that extends from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. And it is a system where the, pro the, the majority of cells are dopamine neurons. And when drugs hit the brain, the, this dopamine is massively enhanced. So there's an increase of dopamine, particularly in the nucleus accumbens, but also in the ventral tegmental area. And that is sort of the initial trigger that may lead to addiction in some individuals. Mm -hmm. So this is the first step. The second step then is that this dopamine that increases has an effect on glutamate transmission in the target region. In the nucleus accumbens, cortex sends extensions to the neurons in the accumbens. These are glutamatergic, excitatory neurons, and their efficacy, how they activate these uh, neurons in the accumbens changes as a function of dopamine. In some cells, that increases the uh, transmission, and in other, it had a tendency to decrease depending on what type of dopamine receptor these cells express. So this is the first, the second step, which is a step of synaptic plasticity. That is, dopamine modulates how glutamate talks to these uh, to these neurons. I see. So when you when someone or an animal ingests. Um, certain drugs, cocaine, for example, you get this surge in dopamine coming from this place called the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, to the nucleus accumbens. And that change then alters how other inputs to that region are operating. And then you get physical changes, neuroplasticity happening, and that leads to behavioral change ultimately. Uh, absolutely. So it is a, a sort of a tripartite organization between dopamine coming from the midbrain up to the striatum, the nucleus accumbens is part of the striatum. And on the other hand, you have cortical top-down projections and if the onto those neurons in the accumbens. And if those three elements talk to each other, dopamine modulates how glutamate can talk to the neurons in the accumbens. So it's a neuromodulatory role of dopamine that is underlying the changes in synaptic efficacy, neural plasticity, as you said, and eventually behavior. Mm -hmm. And so addictive drugs, drugs that are addictive compared to drugs that are not addictive, they all share this common property of affecting the sort of dopamine surge that goes from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens. The details are probably different from drug to drug, um, but that's yeah, sort of so the key thing. Yes, that's the key thing. There are, there are three distinct mechanisms how uh, drugs can do this. They can simply activate those cells, depolarize them, they become more active, or they can, as uh, cocaine does it, block the reuptake of the dopamine that has already been released. And the third class is a class that works indirectly, not targeting the dopamine neurons, but upstream inhibitory interneurons. And when they are silenced, the dopamine neurons is disinhibited, are disinhibited, and that increases the dopamine. So yes, that is a commonality of all addictive drugs, and you can put them to the test with substances that are psychoactive but are not addictive, like uh, hallucinogens. Mm. So they do not increase dopamine in the mesolimbic system. I see. So all addictive drugs share this property. They can cause addiction through different mechanisms, but they sort of converge at this place in the brain doing with this kind of effect on dopamine signaling and plasticity generally. So not all drugs have that property, as you just said. Psychedelics are one example. They work through other mechanisms. We're going to start talking about ketamine. And so what had been known up until your paper about how ketamine was acting in this mesolimbic dopamine reward circuit? So before we go to ketamine, if I may, there is a third step that is really important. Once we have this plasticity incumbents, that's by no means sufficient to already qualify as addiction. This is a step that actually happens 
in all individuals and drive some of the early adaptive changes that we see with drugs. Mm. The crucial step, however, then is when animals or individuals go from a controlled drug consumption to a compulsive drug consumption. And this step is a step that only occurs in some individuals. We know that for cocaine, this is roughly 20%. And we know also that this now requires circuits that are more dorsally located. So we, we move from the ventral striatum to the dorsal striatum. And when that happens, some individual may become compulsive. So there are three steps. The initial triggering of the dopamine surge. The second one is the first type of neural plasticity in the accumbens. And the third then is the relay to the dorsal structures. And only if these three sequences happen, an individual eventually is addicted. I see. So the, the first sort of piece um, in that pathway happens in everyone, but then only in a minority of people do you get the last part happening, which is closely tied to the actual addictive part of this. Absolutely. Then that is, 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 is a challenge also in the research to understand because we have this, uh, one might call it stochastic element to it, that some individuals become addicted and some others will not, despite the fact that they essentially use the same amount of drugs. So hmm. it's, 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 there is some element to that. And while in the beginning I struggled to understand this concept, it actually is pretty obvious. Many of us use addictive drugs, such as alcohol, for an entire adult life, and we never lose control. So there's clearly, for these kind of drugs, there are, is a majority of people actually can use drugs for prolonged periods of time and never fulfill the criteria of addiction. Is it easy to tell ahead of time, either in humans or in animals, which individuals are predisposed to developing addiction? That actually is a difficult question. And we do have some behavioral hallmarks, mostly from the clinical literature. We know, for example, that people who are impulsive, who can't wait for some things, they are at risk for being for becoming addicted and becoming compulsive. So yes, this is there's a, a, at the behavioral level we have some elements that let us predict, but they are by no means. 100%. Mm -hmm. And at the level of the neural circuits, this is ongoing research. We do not have good markers to predict which individuals will eventually become addicted. Okay. So now if we start to think about a drug like ketamine, what was known, you know, is this known to be an addictive drug? Is that something that's been debated? And what, what was the state of the field um, up until recently? So Ketamine is a drug that has been around for many years. It was developed in the 1960s. The main purpose was to generate an anesthetic, to some extent also a, a drug that would relieve pain. But it also has become clear that it is abused in uh, club settings and uh, for its uh, dissociative properties. So people found this attractive. And uh, there have been occasional descriptions of people who sort of lost control, but there was never a big study to really establish its addiction liability. And uh, recently, however, what has changed is that uh, some really interesting work in psychiatry has shown us that uh, ketamine has this potential of uh, being a rapidly acting antidepressant. And for that reason, many more people have now been prescribed ketamine. And so that question of its addiction liability has to be reassessed. Since we know it's a stochastic process, not everybody might eventually become addicted. So we have to test this. And our contribution is to use our knowledge about the neural changes in the brain of mice to put ketamine to that test. So we're going to look you know, first, does it increase dopamine? Second, does it cause the plasticity? And third, is it going to lead to compulsion? So that was that's our contribution to uh, to this question. And was it already known, or was it unknown whether ketamine causes this uh, dopamine surge in this mesolimbic dopamine reward system? There, there was contradicting evidence. Some people saw a little increase, some people did not see an increase. And I think that is explained largely by the absence of the appropriate tools. Mm. We did not have 
a tool that would, with certainty and with the fast temporal kinetics, allow us to follow dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and the VTA. And this is sort of how we got into it. It is the these newly developed genetically encoded dopamine sensors that allow us to translate dopamine concentration into fluorescence and allow us, therefore, to look at dopamine in vivo in freely moving mice in response to a drug or in other situations. And that, for us, has been a game changer. And that's how we sort of got into that project, because we could now really measure and visualize dopamine in the areas that matter. I see. So you actually have tools now where you can take mice and literally look inside their brain. And when dopamine is release, released, it literally lights up and you can see it. Yeah. So the, the, these are really, uh, it's a new generation of fluorescent sensors developed essentially by two labs, uh, Lin Tian at UC Davis and Yu Long Li at uh, Peking University. And what they have been able to do is they have to they took a part of the receptor, the dopamine receptor, made it inert so it wouldn't signal to the cell, but coupled it to a green fluorescent protein. And so whenever dopamine binds onto that receptor, it pulls a little bit on that uh, green fluorescent protein, which changes its uh, fluorescence. And you can then calibrate this and you see dopamine increases. And you can see that with very high specificity and very high sensitivity. And that for us has been really a game changer. This became available in 2018. Okay, so this is uh, this is new technology uh, that's very exciting. So you have this at your fingertips. And so what do you see? What is actually, what is ketamine doing at this critical VTA to accumbens synapse? Yeah, so what we do, we, we do inject this uh, D light, it is called dopamine light and uh, into the accumbens and uh, put in an optical fiber to monitor the fluorescence and then inject ketamine. And what we see is, yes, indeed, there is an increase in dopamine. But what was very surprising and, and in, in, in amplitude and how strong it was, was almost comparable to cocaine. But what was very peculiar is that it returned to baseline very quickly. Mm. actually during the time that ketamine was still in the brain. So it had this effect of creating a surge, but that surge was much faster than anything we expected. So that was the first observation. And so, so if you compare that to something like cocaine, what you're saying is you see a surge with both drugs, but the surge lasts longer with something like cocaine and it yeah. shuts off more quickly with ketamine. So with cocaine, the surge lasts as long as cocaine is in the brain. Mm. And with ketamine, it's faster and it, it, it actually is it stopped while ketamine is still on board. So the first thing we had to find is what makes that, so, so how is that, uh, that, that surge generated and why is it so fast? So for that, we then took advantage of other technology that allowed us to look at the firing rate of the self, the dopamine neurons. And what we saw is that the dopamine neurons, they did fire more and they were therefore at the origin of the surge. But the cause for that was not at the level of the dopamine neurons themselves, but it was because ketamine inhibited the GABA neurons, the inhibitory neurons that are upstream of the dopamine neurons. So it felt in that third class that I described before of drug that work through disinhibition. But I again, see. the problem we had is that the GABA neurons, on the other hand, they remained inhibited despite the fact that the dopamine surge was terminated and the dopamine neurons were no longer firing. So we had a partial explanation, but we still couldn't explain why it was so fast. Okay, so, so the dopamine neurons are there. They've got all of these inhibitory neurons connecting to them that are sort of acting like brakes and preventing the neurons from firing inappropriately when they're not supposed to, the ketamine is actually disactivating the dopamine neurons indirectly by inhibiting the inhibitory neurons. Exactly. So this is exactly the disinhibition mechanism that you set this very well. And so what else is ketamine doing mechanistically and how does that start to tie into this puzzle? Okay. So then the in order to 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 understand why the, the, the its action was terminated so quickly, we we actually 
sort of found out that it hits special receptors on the dopamine neurons that can silence those. These are a type of dopamine neurons, uh, dopamine receptors called D2 receptors, which couple to a potassium channels and hyperpolarized T cells. And it is through that mechanism that we have, uh, 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 that the search is terminated very quickly. So at that point, when we understood this, the disinhibition, the increase of dopamine, but that dopamine then feeds back onto the dopamine neurons to activate D2 receptors and terminates that surge. Then we had an understanding of this initial step that happened. I see. So ketamine gets into the brain. It disinhibits the dopamine neurons by inhibiting the inhibitory neurons. You get this surge in dopamine release, but that very quickly shuts off because the ketamine is also inhibiting the activity through these other dopamine channels of the dopamine neurons directly. Absolutely. Yes. So it's a, it's a complex that gave us the idea for the title. It's a dual action. It's an action of inhibition, but then inhibition again. And, and that uh, was for us a very interesting thing. So the question was, is this now a direct effect of ketamine or is it the, is it the indirect effect through the dopamine? And I think uh, the literature is still open. Some people say that uh, ketamine can actually directly activate these D2 receptors and others disagree with that. I think that is uh, still an open question. But the fact is that these searches are very fast. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you a very different sort of dopamine release profile and different um, dynamics in the circuit compared to something like cocaine. And you would imagine that that would affect the addiction liability of the substance. So how do you actually measure that in animals? Yeah. So the next step obviously is, do we see these drug evoked synaptic plasticities that we typically see with other addictive drugs? And we did a side-by-side -side comparison. So injection of cocaine, we had very nice uh, changes in synaptic efficacy in the accumbens. And with ketamine, we didn't see this at all. There was no drug-evoked synaptic plasticity. And so that was already indicating that probably that search was so fast that it was insufficient to do that, or there were additional mechanisms at play that prevented this, uh, this, uh, this plasticity from being induced. And it turned out that it is a combination of both. <laughs> And so the way we sort of uh, were able to get at that is by looking at the requirements of inducing that plasticity. And one of the key elements of that is a receptor called NMDA receptor, which is a receptor that binds glutamate and is at the beginning of many forms of synaptic plasticity. And it turns out that uh, ketamine actually is a drug that inhibits the NMDA receptor. So that is uh, it, it was at the what was explaining to us why we don't have this plasticity that we usually see with addictive drugs. Yeah, it, it actually kind of makes a lot of sense. Typically, when you take a neuroscience 101 course and you start learning about synaptic plasticity, that's when you get introduced to NMDA receptors. And the basic sort of cartoon idea here is, you know, if one neuron is talking to another neuron there's some level of stuff happening in the second cell. But if a bunch of neurons simultaneously start talking to that same downstream neuron, you get this extra receptor that comes into the scene. It's the NMDA receptor. And that's directly tied with a bunch of stuff that happens inside the cell that's necessary to physically reshape the, the synapses of that cell. And so ketamine, you're saying, was known already to block this receptor. And that, that seems to be a key thing here for preventing the type of plasticity that you tend to see with drugs of addiction. Absolutely. So the blockade of these NMDA receptors precluded the plasticity from being induced. That's a technical term we use. And the, the way usually this uh, plasticity is expressed is that the NMDA receptor triggers the insertion of the other glutamate receptor, which is the AMPA receptors, and that makes the synapse stronger. So you can measure, and that's something we did in this project, the ratio of the current flowing through AMPA receptors and the one flowing through NMDA receptors. And when that ratio goes up, this is a reflection of a strengthening of the synapse. And that did happen with cocaine, but not with ketamine. Not at all or less? Not at all. So I that was the thing. So at the point that we were sort of saying, well, maybe 
we should be challenging the system a little more. And so we developed the sort of injection protocols that would overcome the fast return to baseline by giving injection ever so often, we were able to accumulate the dopamine searches and make them longer artificially by, you know, carefully, mm. each time it goes down, you give another shot of, of ketamine. And that then gave us uh, larger and longer dopamine searches that were comparable to the one with cocaine. And despite that challenge, we still had no plasticity whatsoever. I see. So even though you get the surge in dopamine, even though you can make that bigger by giving more doses of ketamine one after the other, the fact that this drug is blocking the NMDA receptor is preventing that next step of synaptic Absolutely. plasticity. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And are you? What kind of doses are you using here? Are they? Are, were they doses uh, designed to be comparable to what people would use in a recreational setting? Absolutely. So these are doses that are comparable to the recreational and well below the anesthetic. So we made mm. sure that when we give single doses, the animals would show a reaction as they also show with cocaine uh, of, of a sort of a moving a little bit more. We call this hyperlocomotion, but mm. it was not sedative. At that stage, we were well below anesthetic concentrations. Yeah. So an interesting question, I think, that's just occurring to me is, so you're using a dose that's comparable to what a recreational user would use, which would have psychoactive effects. It's much lower than the dose that a doctor would use for anesthetic effects. What's interesting about ketamine in the realm of acting as an antidepressant is my understanding is people are using low doses, even lower than the ones that would give you psychoactive effects um, or dissociative effects. Did you test lower doses here and see what was going on? Because I could actually imagine... Um, in principle, right? Maybe if the dose is sufficiently low, you get some of this dopamine surge, but not so much NMDA receptor antagonism. And uh, is there anything going on there at the low end of the dose range? We, we did try different uh, concentrations and we settled for one that was comparable to uh, the acute responses we saw with, uh, with cocaine. So I don't believe that lower doses would be more dangerous. I, I, I don't think that would be the case. I think the system is in balance. And if you go lower, then there's virtually no dopamine search. And for that reason, that mechanism may then prevail. Mm -hmm. And so what does this mean about thinking about the addiction liability of ketamine for humans? Because on the one hand, um, your results are quite striking and clear. On the other hand, you know, anecdotally, at least, we, we do seem to see that some percentage of people do start habitually using ketamine after they start. So should we think of ketamine as non-addictive or just weakly addictive? Or how do we think about that? There's no guarantee it's not addictive. And for that reason, we actually carried out the third group of experiments where we uh, tried to induce compulsion nevertheless. And uh, that, of course, is something that was a tricky experiment because you have to do many, many individuals in order to uh, conclude that there is nothing. But we did a reasonable number of uh, animals, and we did not find a single one that would become compulsive or really would be ready to even self-administer if it is a little bit more complicated, that is, if they have to press several times uh, and, and that they simply wouldn't do anymore. So yes, we think in the animal model with all its limitations, the indication is that the addiction liability is low. So how does that translate to the human? Obviously is something we now have to discuss with the expert on uh, human addiction mm -hmm. and uh, human imaging will be helpful and larger epidemiological studies. So what we provide here sort of a guidance through the neurobiological mechanism. But of course, this is not a guarantee that there's zero addiction. But I think it, had we found the other way, have we had we found all these changes that we typically see with addictive uh, drugs, then it really would have been a red flag. And people would have to discuss again, whether it's a good idea to give ketamine to many people in the context of treating their depression. I think it's a, it's a discussion of access to care, who should get it, because you could argue that uh, maybe some people of whom we know that they're vulnerable or they already have been addicted, they uh, should have special scrutiny in terms of uh, being treated uh, with ketamine for addiction, uh, for depression, sorry. I see. And 
you know, I know this wasn't the focus of your paper. You were looking at the addiction liability of ketamine and dissecting some of the mechanisms that were at play there. Do we know what mechanisms are at play for the rapid onset antidepressant effects that people have been observing? This is also, it's just an ongoing discussion, but I think there's a very compelling evidence also from animal models, uh, in particular from the lab of uh, Hailan Hu in China, where she has been able to identify a part of the brain, the lateral habenula, as one of the prime targets of ketamine. And so what she has been able to do is to show that in these neurons that are upstream actually of the ventral tegmental area, that there are NMDA-mediated bursts in mouse models of depression. And ketamine successfully suppresses these bursts, these repetitive activity. And when you do so, then some of the symptoms that may reflect elements of depression in the animal model disappear. So I think that is a very compelling and very interesting observation. And uh, the field sort of builds on that to better understand how it works. But it goes to show that as with many drugs, the locus, uh, it, it acts in many locuses in the brain. And in the VTA, it has something to do with addiction. In the lateral habenula, it's probably more the antidepressant effect. So this is, this is, is a very common theme in all pharmacology that the drug goes to the entire brain, but has very specific effects depending on where it acts. I see. And so, you know, going back to your your results, you know, ketamine causes this transient short-term surge in dopamine. It doesn't cause the stuff that happens downstream of that, that other drugs of addiction cause. Is that very unusual or are there other examples of drugs that have that property? Now, to my knowledge, this is the first time we had this uh, unique constellation of increasing dopamine, but then not engaging the subsequent cascades of uh, plasticity that we know underpins the adaptive behavior in addiction. Mm -hmm. Now, it is, uh, for us, was also was the first time we saw such a drug that could do that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was the first time I had heard of it, um, and it's you know it, it's a very um, convenient property for the drug to have. Um, what are some of the the questions that your lab is asking now, or what are some of the big open uh, questions in the realm of ketamine and how it's operating in the brain? Well, certainly we would like to better understand the additional functions of ketamine, such as uh, depressive. So how to put together a, a sort of a unifying uh, element. Uh, there are also questions as to additional targets in on top of the NMDA receptor. That is uh, is not so clear how this uh, really works. Um, so these are some of the questions that we have. But of course, for us, we're probably going to go back a little bit more in the core questions of addiction. And what for us is a really basic question is to identify the neural signature of those individuals that eventually will go on and become addicted. So can we find in the brain something special, you know, a transcript, tra transcriptional signature in some cells that would predict that some individuals become addicted? And I, 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 this is one of the questions and related also to ketamine and, and, and uh, psychedelics that we mentioned, there is an additional system that impinges on it that we haven't mentioned yet, which sort of modulates the way dopamine works in part, and that's the serotonin system. Mm. And that is very interesting because it is a system that is much more diffuse, projects basically everywhere in the brain, has a larger number of receptors than dopamine receptors, and can change synapses as well. So maybe the same synapse that undergoes change because of dopamine, then also receives messages from serotonin to change in a different way. And we have in the past, we have uh, in 2021, we have had a first look at the interaction between dopamine and serotonin, and that actually is a really fascinating topic that we further develop in our lab. In terms of ketamine's pharmacology, so it antagonizes or blocks the NMDA receptor, is it known to have other direct receptor interactions or is that an unknown? 
No, there are, there, there's binding to other receptors. The question is only how strong is this binding, how, how pharmacologically relevant it is. As I mm -hmm. mentioned, people have claimed that there is a binding to the D2 receptor. Uh, there are some other receptors that it binds to also, but it, there's no unifying uh, agreement on how important it is for very specific functions. Interesting. And so what's your expectation with respect to how ketamine will continue to be used as a therapeutic in humans? Do you think it's likely that we'll see larger scale clinical trials replicating some of the, the antidepressant effects we've seen so far? Do you think there are any major risks to continuing down this path? How do you, how do you think about the human side? So my reading from the outside of that field, as I'm not doing active research myself, is that uh, Yes, I mean, it's definitely been a game changer in the terms that for the first time we had a drug that could act immediately. The typical antidepressants, such as the reuptake inhibitors of serotonin, uh, they only act a few weeks after you started the treatment. And that has always been a very, uh, very serious limitation of, of, the, of the effects. And so, uh, so, so to have this rapid one is, is, is really, it was a game changer, but people now realize that unfortunately these effects are not long lasting and that many people who receive ketamine as antidepressant respond initially very well, but then the effect somehow wears off, even if you repeat the dose. Mm. And so I think that is going to be one of the big challenges in the field. And again, knowing the underlying neural mechanism may help you to overcome this uh, desensitization, if you will. So I think that's going to be one of the big questions that people will ask. Interesting. Well, Christian, is there anything else you want to leave people with in terms of your recent results or this field generally when it comes to ketamine for depression or the addiction liability of a drug like this? Well, I guess one element that I find really interesting, but somewhat also puzzling, is that when you look at the vulnerability to drug addiction in animal models, it is interesting that we can reproduce these two groups that we also see in the human. So it's really not a big variance where we then take the top and the bottom of that distribution, but with the a combination of giving a drug and having a negative consequence, we have really two groups emerging. And as I said, for cocaine, it's roughly 20%. And this is also true for mice. So the, you know, maybe it's 18% or so, but it's roughly the same proportions. And I find that very difficult to understand because mm -hmm. if it's genes that control your vulnerability, the mice that we use are genetically homogeneous. They're inbred and they are a special line and they're virtually identical. Humans, on the other hand, obviously are genetically very diverse. So how is it even possible that this uh, it leads to the same proportion? And so one idea that we had and others also is that it may actually not be the genes that determine your vulnerability, but it may be epigenetic mechanism regulating the expression of genes in specific cells. And that is something I find really interesting and uh, something we're actively pursuing in the lab. We would like to understand how life experience, such as uh, you know, a strong stressor or, or something also very beautiful, can have an effect on the expression of genes in some cells and therefore reorganize circuits in a way that in the end, uh, someone is resilient or vulnerable to drug addiction. And that may actually have a shared commonality with the vulnerability to depression and other psychiatric diseases. So I think that is an exciting avenue of research, knowing that from circuit neuroscience, where we should look. And so we go look and now, and we can say, okay, in those cells, there is before the individual even is exposed to the first drug dose, there is something going on that makes this person vulnerable to addiction and by extension, possibly also to depression. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question. What you're saying is, you know, roughly 20% of people who use cocaine develop compulsive drug-seeking behavior 
That's also true in mice. Roughly 20% will develop that. Naturally, one might think, well, maybe 20% of people have a mutation in a dopamine receptor gene and that predisposes them or something. But what you're saying is that can't be true because it's true of the human population, which is uh, not inbred and is genetically diverse, but it's also true in these mice, but they're genetically basically identical. Yeah. And, and the active search for all these uh, prime candidates of uh, dopamine receptors or, 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 re or, or the, the molecule that binds cocaine and so have not yielded differences between people who are addicts and people who are not. So the very first uh, attempt was when people realized that among the three opioid receptors, the mu receptor that drives that positive reinforcement that eventually may lead to addiction when someone takes heroin, for example, uh, now that they have looked very carefully, the opiate receptor in heroin addicts is no different from an opiate receptor in a normal person who, hmm. and a person who is not addicted. Yeah. How, how do you even start to think about how you would experimentally study that? Would you uh, very carefully try and control the early life history of mice and you know subject some of them to certain stressors or prevent certain natural stressors um, in other ones and see if that is causing them to develop this propensity to addiction? Yes. So you could, for example, also look uh, something that mice do. They have a social hierarchy within a litter mm. and you see whether there is a correlation between uh, the rank in the litter and the risk then you can do uh, select animals for some uh, individual traits, such as impulsivity. So we made, for example, the observation that animals that in uh, operant behavior uh, cannot wait to press the lever, even if there is a timeout, uh, which can could be somehow interpreted as a reflection of impulsivity, that these mice are more likely to go on and become compulsive. So yes, you can select for some behavioral traits, and you can then also challenge uh, the mice, for example, by uh, separating them a little earlier from their mother, which is a very strong stressor for them, and see whether that has an impact on uh, gene expression or epigenetic mechanism and eventually uh, drug addiction. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And, you know, it could tie into your work that brings serotonin into the picture because my understanding is a lot of the serotonin circuits are at least partly involved in things like um, an animal's knowledge and perception of its own sort of social status and, and where it falls in these hierarchies. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we're all into now serotonin. Is, I think it's really exciting. And, and, and again, for two reasons, because these genetically encoded sensor are also available now for serotonin. So we don't only have the D light, we also have the S light. And now we can monitor serotonin when an animal moves around and see when does it ink, when does it change. So this is this is one of the thing. And the other thing is that we know that the serotonin system is the target of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So the 5-HT2A receptor is the, is the primary target of psychedelics. And there have been, again, anecdotal reports that uh, some people find it easier to quit drugs when they have taken psilocybin, for example. But that, of course, is a little bit anecdotal, and it would be extremely helpful to the field if there was some mechanistic insight. And so these are some of the questions where we're asking and we're actively pursuing in the lab. Well, Dr. Christian Lusher, uh, fascinating stuff as always. And it sounds like uh, before too long, I'll probably send you another email to come back and tell me about some some With really pleasure, result. with pleasure. Thank you so much, Nate. This episode is supported in part by The Amino Company. They specialize in making science-backed amino acid products that you can mix into any drink. Their products contain a mixture of essential amino acids, the building blocks of proteins in the body, as well as other nutrients including minerals like iron and electrolytes like potassium. Your body is constantly repairing damage and your muscles and tissues need the right mix of amino acids and nutrients to do this effectively. One thing I like about Amino Co. is they actually conduct clinical trials to determine what their products really do. They have a variety of formulations and 
engineered for different purposes. And my personal favorite is one called Heal, which has been shown to be three times more efficient at triggering muscle growth and repair than other protein sources. It helps maintain healthy inflammation levels and preserve muscle mass during periods of inactivity. I mix this product into the water bottle I bring to the gym and consume it before, during, and after my workouts. And I have felt a noticeable difference in my performance during those workouts and my recovery times from soreness and fatigue afterwards. Their products are keto friendly, soy free, vegetarian or vegan, gluten free, and non GMO. So they are compatible with almost any diet or lifestyle. You can support the podcast and try Heal or any of their other products by using the discount code MIND when you visit aminoco.com slash mind. You will get 30% off your purchase. If you work out regularly or do intensive exercise, I recommend trying AminoCo's products. I get a lot of companies reaching out to me about advertising and I only end up using and liking a small percentage of the products that I see. So check out aminoco.com slash mind and use the code MIND to try these products today for 30% off.